Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. On behalf of President Sprega, I'd like to welcome you to Bristol Community College. Thank you for joining us today for this vitally important discussion on grief and healing. My name is Michael Bensink. I serve as the Director of Counseling Services here at BCC. And I've also had the great opportunity to mentor Darlene as she developed this event. But surely the credit is hers. Appropriately, I am very pleased to introduce to you BCC student Darlene Tetro. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to my grief awareness event here at Bristol Community College. There are refreshments. Help yourself. Please be courteous to our speakers who are dedicated their time to such a great cause. My hope is that you will leave here today with more than you came with. A lighter heart knowing there is help. With loss, this is especially important because of grief that can come with it. Even if you yourself has not experienced a significant loss in your life, undoubtedly you know somebody who has. Perhaps a friend, family, colleague. But our busy lives, where do you turn? Is there help out there? And where can we find it? There are a few of the many important reasons why I brought this event in front of you today. To show you what resources are out there. And there are truly organizations and people in the community ready and willing to help you get through it. In fact, upon the passing of my loving daughter, Marissa Ann, I found myself pondering these very same questions. She is my inspiration for this event, and I am holding it in her memory. Marissa's kind, beautiful, passionate face is the one I, I'm sure that you saw adorning all the poster boards here today. Even though I am still working through my grief, I was fortunate enough to find a wonderful group of people in my community and in my faith that were able to help me through and are still helping me through my grief even today. My name is Darlene Tatro, and I am an LPN certified EMT and a student here at BCC, as well as being Thanatology certified. On Thanksgiving 2011, I lost my beloved daughter, Marissa Ann. She is the reason why I have put together today's grief awareness event. Knowing this, you can see where my passion comes from and the truly personal reason why I base my leadership project on grieving. Being able to find the help that I needed is what I wanted to pass on this gift to as many others as possible. Today you are going to be hearing from many diverse group of professionals and specialists who can help you through your grief as well. They are speakers from the mayor's office, healers, counselors, chaplains, and also representatives from STAR, clinic, and other professionals from our community. Now I want to take this opportunity to thank from the bottom of my heart for volunteering their time and coming to speak to you today. Without their support and the support of all the wonderful sponsors, this event would have never come to fruition. I would like to thank all of our local uh, Fall River sponsors, Dunkin' Donuts and Papa Gino's on Ellsbury Street for the wonderful food we have there. Um, Stop and Shop on Rodman Street. They have de um, donated all the beautiful arrangements that you have seen and Minuteman Press on Columbia Street. And of course, I need to thank my greatest sponsor, whom with I may not still be alive today. He has been there through me, with through thick and thin, and has readily stood by my side. This would be my loving husband of 18 years, Stephen Tatro. And at last but not least, I want to thank all of the loving and helpful staff that have volunteered to help me with this event as well. Especially my mentor, Michael Bensink, who is the Director of Counseling Services here at BCC. <laughs> he 
He has been absolutely crucial and vital to the development and organization of today's program. It is because of his efforts that I am here before you today. Michael, thank you for your guidance and for your friendship. I don't know where you are. Oh. <laughs> okay, so um, I would like to introduce our next speaker without further ado, uh, Ms. Maureen Hancock, who is internationally known for her work with children and families with cancer and holistic healing. She continuously gives so freely of herself. And speaking candidly with Maureen, we agree, God works in mysterious ways. I am grateful for her friendship and her assistance. Please welcome Maureen Hancock. You're a little sweaty, darling. <laughs> Isn't she doing great? It's not easy to stand up here, and especially with such an overwhelming subject matter. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, my background and tell you some stories of healing and hope and um, how this all began for me, getting involved with working with folks who are grieving. I actually uh, had a childhood illness, lead paint poisoning. Um, and spent three years in Children's Hospital in Boston. I was in a coma. Um, truly a miracle that I survived. Back in the day when everything was lead paint based. Anyone else chew window sills? <laughs> lead chips? No. Show of hands. This area. A lot of lead paint. So my mom actually uh, got the bill passed on the state and federal level for uh, lead paint poisoning prevention. And um, so she's the reason why you can't sell your house. So, yeah, you can laugh, okay. <laughs> it's not gonna be all tears. Uh, this is a celebration today of life and, and memories. So I try to keep it a little bit light. So when I came home from the hospital at five years old, um, I used to see people walking all around the house. And I told my um, head of the God Squad, Irish Catholic mother, that the Sacred Heart of Jesus picture was speaking to me, my little four foot ten Irish mother. What's he saying? <laughs> so we have a lot of faith, and uh, that's where this comes from for me. And I try to give as much as I can. Um, over the years, I tried to suppress uh, being able to feel things and know things. Um, but in 1992, I was in a car accident, and I fell asleep at the wheel and I hit a tree and I broke every bone in my face. I bent the steering wheel in half and I was standing outside of a completely crushed vehicle when the fire rescue team showed up. They kept asking me who pulled me out of the car. Um, on impact, I actually felt a warm rush go through my body. I heard my grandmother's voice. I knew she was with me, and um, I credit her for my divine intervention, uh, and God, and everybody else. Um, but I was standing outside of the car, and a woman who called 911 said that she felt somebody shake her shoulders. She was sound asleep, and she heard, go downstairs to the kitchen and wait. And sure enough, I showed up at her door. She called you know, for help. And I was set up for all kinds of surgery at Mass General, Mass Ioneer. And when they went to do surgery, everything was healed. They couldn't understand it. They kept bringing in doctors and nurses. And um, I'm one of nine, several of us have actually had uh, near-death experiences with the Coma family from Stoughton. That was funny. <laughs> Not really. But that's why I drink vodka. <laughs> Irish, you know. So, anyway, um, so after that accident, I started to notice that I was um, more sensitive. And I just always knew in my heart I wanted to work with sick people. I used to say it from the age of five to my mom. 
what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to help the sick. I want to help the sick. So I studied a lot of different uh, massage therapies and um, hands-on healing and using the power of prayer for those who are sick as well. So I've seen a lot of miracles happen. I'm just a conduit, and today you're going to hear uh, from many different speakers of uh, many different tools that you can put in your toolbox to use on your journey through grief. Because let's face it, we've all filled an ocean with tears, missing someone who's gone home before us, wondering are they okay, and you know, do they hear our prayers, are they still with us? And I believe that they try to let you know in subtle ways that they're still around. I'm sure a lot of people here get signs or have dreams. How many here have had a dream of a past loved one? Yeah, you have. Not the ones where they're yelling at you either. This guy here, yeah. Relax, you can't catch this. <laughs> if you have hope though, you can catch this. So, so anyway, um, my nephew passed away suddenly at 19. Uh, his car fell on him. We just never thought that such a tragedy would hit us, just like Darlene. You just never thought that you would be faced with such immense grief. And, um, you know, Sean, my nephew, comes to us all the time and just keeps saying, you know, I'm still here with you. I'm going to help guide you. I can hear you. So just be open to that. Um, they want us to be happy. They want us to celebrate life, to keep living. And so many of us are so stuck in our grief that you need a lot of the tools that are going to be offered today um, to help you. I always say grief counseling is number one. Having you know, your faith in whatever way that means to you. Holding on to something that can get you through because you're not alone and sometimes you feel like you're alone and that they can't hear you, and they do. So I work with um, sick children and adults who are getting ready to pass. The children that I work with are so, so brave. Um, this one little boy that I helped who uh, had a brain tumor, six years old, little Johnny from Pennsylvania. Every day we would get on Skype together because uh, obviously he couldn't come to me. If you don't know Skype, it's free video conferencing. And he would sit there with his bowl of cereal. Mommy, tell me about heaven. What's it gonna be like? Am I gonna be able to do crosswords? And my heart's breaking as this little boy is um, asking his questions about heaven and so, so brave, never complained. The day that he passed, I was on the computer with the family. Of course, the dad, you know, who's gonna be here to take my son? And I'm like, well, he's not gonna be alone. And the moment he passed, I have pictures of this, a ray of sunlight came through the window and made the sign of a cross right on his chest. So, there's the answer. Um, as so many of these kids that I work with, um, they just, they really help put life in perspective. So today is about grief awareness, but it's also about how do we live life to the fullest? How do we get the most out of this life and, and really feed your soul, um, knowing that they're rooting for us, that they, they want us to go on, they want us to be okay. I'm sure there was many times when, you know, you didn't know how you would survive, right? And so Darlene, as she mentioned, reached out with the many resources here today. Um, I'm gonna actually go around the room and ask if anyone has any questions. Uh, don't be shy, this is your chance. I get probably 200 emails a day from people asking uh, their most burning questions. I don't have all the answers when I get there, I will, <laughs> but from the many, many years of doing this work, um, I can offer you what I feel in my heart, and you can do what you want with it. But this is your chance if you have a question um, or something that you want to share. Maybe you've had a divine intervention or something that helped you get through grief. Maybe you were crying your eyes out, and all of a sudden, you know, that certain song came on the radio, or, you know, someone came to you in a dream and gave you a hug and it felt real, 
and they told you that they're okay and that you're going to be okay. So, uh, does anyone have any questions? Or do we have another mic here? Yeah. Oh, we're good. Yeah. Okay. I'll come it down. Here we go. Everybody looks so scared. Oh, my water just fell. <laughs> And you know what? That brings up a good point. Um, is everything a sign? No. Do we talk ourselves uh, into them? Like, well, maybe this could be it. I feel like when you really get a sign from a loved one uh, in heaven, that you'll just know it feels right. You're like, how could that be? But we're so busy and human that we get carried away and you know we block things. Um, we block the healing process. I say you have to feel it to heal it, right? So, you know, there's many different stages to grief, um, which I'm sure some of our experts will talk about. But I always say there's no set, um, I don't know, schedule for grief. One day you might feel good, the next day you feel crappy. All of a sudden, out of the blue, you burst into tears for no reason, right? Or for every reason. So, and here's my own mic. <laughs> I thought she was a spirit, she could take a pasty. <laughs> okay, you do laugh. Former stand-up comedian. So, um, but don't let anybody take away from your grieving process. Like, some people try to put a time limit on it. Like, oh, you should be, you know, feeling better by now. Or you should be over it. It's a, it's a continuous journey that will be through your whole life. Um, and, and no one can tell you how to do it either. So whatever feels right to you, and I know Darlene has a lot of great information on the handouts. Um, I think journaling is great, uh, praying, meditating, whatever works for you. You have a question? No, but, um, Stand up. Going through the process of grief after losing my son five and a half years ago, I became a songwriter, so I used music to help push me through that and heal me and a lot of other people with the music. So helping other people helps us, moves us through that. Right. And, and don't you think Darlene is so brave to do this? I know she was panicking. She was shaking in the back. <laughs> so it, it's tough, but every single person in this room is, is grieving or has had grief in their life or been touched by grief. So that's awesome. Give a hand for this woman. Give me a hug. All right, I'm going to give you one of my CDs, Healing Grief. There you go. So, do you have a question? I just lost my sister uh, nine weeks ago. And in October, I was in church, and God told me that I had to go on a mission um, to the Dominican Republic. And I had no job. I was being operated on. I was like, God, I'm disabled, I have no money, how am I going to do this? The next day I got a check for $300 in October for my taxes, and I knew I had to go. And then um, my sister died, and two days later I had to go on this trip. And uh, it was so, I got knew in October I was going to need that when my sister passed. And um, when I was down there, she, uh, I said, I haven't heard from you now. And I, mean, I just got out of the shower, I'm drying up, and she goes, get dressed. <laughs> so, you know, in the shower. They don't watch you in the shower. Just want you to know. Because I told her, I don't want to see you in the bathroom anymore. <laughs> but let me just ask you about your, your healing trip, though. Um, did you have visions? You know, was this where they see was the Blessed true. Mother? What, what was the place that you went? Well, I, uh, we helped out uh, medically and uh, building a school for uh, people in the Bates uh, that only make two dollars a day. And we gave them shoes and medicine. And it was, I know God wanted me there. Um, I was the second person in our church to do it. I'd heard the speech for eight years, but I had a job, I had to go, and I had to support myself. But my sister was supporting me, and I just was like, what do I do in it? And she goes, go, you've got to go. God tells you to go, you go. And um, because of that, I, I needed that week of healing of, uh, and it was a tragic death. She fell and hit her head. And so it was just, it's so devastating. 
so raw, so. But I am so blessed, and I don't know how anyone else does it without God in their life, or whatever your God is. So I'm lucky I, that this last year I learned that God's going to take care of me no matter what. So, so give me a hug from heaven. Clap for her. Great. Thank you. Do you have a question? Because I lost my wife in early February this year, and about three or four weeks ago, I sort of dozed off. I, I started joining a support group. And uh, I read it, it's, it's common for people to doze off in the day. And it was the middle of the afternoon, I had the TV on, and I heard the door close. And I looked, and I, I think I looked, I don't know that I was still asleep or that I was awake. And my wife was in that room, and she was like 30 years younger than what she was. Her hair was a lot darker, because when she passed away, her hair was all gray. And it was, uh, it was like dark brown. And she looked over, and, he, and she smiled at me. And she, her mouth was moving. And my youngest daughter said, well, what did she say? I said, I don't know, I couldn't hear it. And then it was over. So I mean, I, I'm sure. No, it was real. I mean, that was scary, right? But when, you know, you just have hope and you just open your heart up. This is, love is stronger than death and love survives death. So she wanted to show you that she was young again and whole again and she had to go home first. You'll be along when you're supposed to, but live life to the fullest in her memory until you're together again. And I'm psyched that there's hair color in heaven. Give me a hug. <laughs> I have to go like every three to four weeks. So, um, can, you, can you give him the CD? Question? I know you don't want to stand up. My 11 year old son passed away two weeks ago. Do you plan to choose our life plan before we're born? I think that um, I'm going to talk to you in private after this, okay? And, and tell you a little bit of my thoughts on that give you one of my healing CDs, but I know that um, you'll be able to feel him. You're in the beginning stages, and this is actually where, you know, uh, some of the grief counselors are talking to a priest, or whatever works for you, I think is really helpful in the beginning, when you're so, so heavy in your grief, you're reaching out, right? You found your way here, you weren't even gonna come here today, right? But, but something or somebody told you you needed to be here, okay? So I'm gonna to talk to you. Give me a hug, will you? Clap for her. I lost my son. He was three years in September. And, um, to get any kind of sign. And that's very, very common with so many moms that I sit with that, you know, you're, you're reaching out and it's like the love is so, so strong that sometimes you won't have the on-demand button to the heavens where you say, if you're here, you show me right now. So that's where trust comes in and faith and just believing that and knowing in your heart he is okay. And you know, when the time is right, he'll show you. But trusting in your heart, one day you'll be together again, one day, right? And have eternal life. We'll all, we survive this physical body. I say this is the lease vehicle. When the lease is up, the driver steps out and continues. And he will show you. It's because you're so super close. It's like a soulmate, you know? Like, if he can't get to you, he's gonna go to those around you. So I know it ticks you off when they have dreams and they tell you, why can't he come to me? I'm his mother, right? Mom, I'm trying, I can't get through, you're too full. You're, you're so heavy in your grief. Have you sought counseling or support groups? I'm just curious. I live in Western Mass, and our Stacy inviting me to come down today. 
that she did. Hey, um, I go to the Compassionate Friends uh, chapter in Springfield, Mass. And uh, there's also um, an Angel Park in East Hampton. And I, um, there's a, an Angel Block with his name on it. Wonderful. Well, I wish you lots of signs and peace. Get up and give me a hug from heaven. Clap for her. I love it so hard. Thank you. How about a question down over here in the nose, please? <laughs> Trying to see beyond the wall or whatever that is. Hi there. Well, a few, a few years ago, my husband had died, and my sister had called me, and she said, what are you doing? And I says, I'm laying on the bed. I love laying on the clean sheets when I'm just making the bed. She says, oh, that's nice. So I go to bed that night, and I'm falling asleep, and all of a sudden, at my doorway, there's a man. And he says to me, I love sleeping on clean sheets also. So I says, come on, lay next to me. So he came, he lay next to me, and I knew that he was sickly. I could tell. So I put my arms slowly over him, and no matter what anybody says, it was my husband. No, it was him. It was him. And since then, he somehow sent my daughter to my house to live with me because he knew I was sick. And I'm fine now, thanks to my daughter. Wonderful. So nice. Give me a hug. So I'm going to ask you all now, before the next speaker comes on, to just close your eyes for a minute. I'm just going to do a, a quick visualization. If you're comfortable, close your eyes. You're a peeker. Stop it. And you, you're always in control. <laughs> close your eyes. And I want you to use all your senses uh, to feel and picture yourself on your favorite beach and you're walking along the water's edge and you can hear the waves wash over the rocks and see your loved ones in heaven on the other side coming towards you and smiling at you and holding their hands out to you and giving you a great big hug and they're holding you and they're whispering to you, live this life to the fullest. Do everything that you can for others, pay it forward forgiveness, love with all your heart, let go of anger and hatred and troubles that no longer serve you, and do this in my name, and know that we will all be together again when it's your time to come home. So slide into home base, don't walk around the bases with your head hung low, and know that love can never, ever truly die. We have eternal life. And open your eyes. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. the ad-lib type, so I have to be <laughs> I'm used to a podium and a lectern. So my name is Father Andrew Johnson. I am originally from Boston, where I grew up. 
Um, and after my uh, education, I entered the Trappist Monastery in Spencer, where I was a monk for 37 years. And then I actually uh, came to the Diocese of Fall River, where I was what is called incarnated. I became a member of the diocese rather than a member of my religious order. And one of my first assignments in the Diocese of Fall River was as chaplain. Now, I have been in eight different hospitals in my priestly career, uh, and the last two were here in the Diocese of Fall River. I was assistant chaplain at Cape Cod Hospital in Hyannis, and then I became head chaplain at Charlton Hospital here in Fall River. And on the morning of Thanksgiving 2011, I met, in sad circumstances, Darlene and Steve, because I was on call when um, we got the call that Marissa had died. So that was my experience with them. Um, and my enrichment by knowing them and my friendship with them. I got the call at 3.30 in the morning and we were there uh, in the hospital until 6.30, just really consoling each other. Uh, with words of faith. I hope to give, besides any of my chaplaincy stories, I'm now, by the way, I'm a pastor of two parishes in Fall River, Good Shepherd, which used to be St. Patrick's, it's a merged parish, and also St. Stanislaus, the little Portu uh, Polish parish, God help us. <laughs> I have a semi-Portuguese parish at Good Shepherd, and I have a Polish parish at St. Stanislaus, and I'm Irish and Swedish, so it's, it's perfect. It's perfect. I hope to give some practical and concrete insight, uh, very little theology, uh, into our topic today. So my background as a priest and as a chaplain, but also as a man, as a human being, who has gone through um, the grieving process in a very concrete and, and powerful way. Um, I'm from a family of uh, three children. My mother and father have both died. I have an older sister still alive. My younger brother had Down syndrome and he died 15 years ago. My brother Robert, I'll get to that in a minute. My experience of grief began with my parents' acceptance of my brother's condition. He was a surprise baby. He was born four years after me, so I think it was a big surprise. And that was 1955, when Down syndrome wasn't even on the charts. And their grief, their wonderment, what happened? Were we the cause of this in any way? No one even knew about the 21st chromosome. So I remember my parents dealing with that. It was a living grief, really, and I was four years old. I'll just tell you, uh, uh, just briefly touching on what Maureen had to say, um, that the little clues that we get from God, okay, I was uh, after my brother died and I was his guardian. I lost my father, my, my mother, and my brother all within five years in the 1990s. And I became my brother's guardian, uh, and he died of hepatitis. He had been in Rentham State School for most of his life, uh, always came home on the weekends. But as you may know, hepatitis was endemic uh, in that population. So in about 1994, his hepatitis became active. And I was his guardian, caring for him. Um, I knew very well. The way my family goes, they said he's got probably two and a half years. He had almost, almost exactly two and a half years to live. We died in November of 1997. And almost immediately, my religious order sent me to Rome to work. I had been studying there in the 80s for three years. My Italian was pretty good. I went back to work in Rome. And I was there for another seven years. So in Rome, you always wear your habit. I was walking down the street in my monastic habit. And as you can imagine, I have a tremendous love for these children, Down syndrome children. 
And there across the street was a boy, I call him a boy, he was probably a young man, walking along with his mother. And he looked over at me and my habit, and he pointed at me, and he said, Prete, prete, prete. If you know any Italian, that's priest, priest, priest. So of course I stopped, I went over to see him. And I said to him, what's your name? Come si chiama? Come ti chiami? And he said, Roberto. My brother's name was Robert. So who can, what science can prove? It's impossible. But to me, that was, as we call it, God winking at me. All right, finding someone who, who knew, right? And to hear that he had my, saint, my brother's name and calling to me and waving to me. So science cannot touch that, right? That's faith. That's what we all have. So the one thing I wanted to speak of as I heard people, um, people discussing their, their own grief is that it's very common for us to use a word and it's, it's a real word when we're dealing with grief. We say loss. I lost my wife. I lost my parents. I lost my brother. And that is a real experience. Uh, one of the greatest and most common desires when we lose people is we want to hear their voices again, right? We all know that. We want to hear their voice. But there's a real sense that our faith tells us that's not the right word to use, that they are in safekeeping. And to call it law, of course, the experience is real of separation. And to deny that is insanity. And yet our faith gives us a whole different way of looking at our experience. I want to talk a little bit about our experience of God when we deal with grief and how we make sense of what we know about God, that he is all good and he is almighty. So how did these things happen to us, right? That's the big question that we need to ask. To look back at the tsunami in 2004, December 26, 2004, 184,000 people confirmed dead, 46,000 missing since then, and of course presumed dead. Well over 50% of those people were children. So immediately, those who don't believe and who are aggressive towards us who do, began to ask the important questions that we have to face. How can God have done that? Or, more correctly, how can God have let that happen? I'll get to this at the end of my talk, but in a sense, it's the most difficult case possible for us who believe. Because this is not an act of man, of evil, or of the devil, or of anything else in the world. It's called a physical evil. Something that happens in nature that affects evil in people's lives. And death is evil. Death is evil. We, we pray every day to overcome it. And we pray that we have the faith to address the deaths that come into our lives. So what do you do? As I say, I'll get back to that, the tsunami question in a, in a bit. What do you do when you come into the hospital at three in the morning and you see someone who has lost a beloved member of their family? What do we do? First of all, keep your mouth shut for a while, all right? No theology. God is so good. Um, this is the famous. Uh, he needed an angel, and he so he took your little your little child. <laughs> I tried this once at my when I first was a chaplain, and I got right back. Well, I wanted him here. Who does God think he is? I wanted my angel here. Very good answer. All right. So no trite or what we think to be consoling comments because they really, what we really want is to console ourselves, 
with thoughts like that, right? I, the priest, get there and I don't want to really deal with the pain of what these people are going through, so I come up with a trite comment. All right, God wanted them in heaven. No, no counseling, no theology, no stupid comments or questions. The best thing to begin with is silence. To sit there in silence with people who are deeply grieving means unconsciously to them, we're ready to share in the grief because they are reduced to silence. And so are we. The book of Job, one of the great texts for grief in the entire Bible, this is from the Old Testament. Everything that Job had gone through, lost his family, lost his wealth, and finally even lost his own health, and his good friends show up. They've heard what's gone on, and they show up to counsel him. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They made an appointment to come together to condole with him and comfort him. And when they saw him from afar, they did not even recognize him in his grief. And they raised their voices and wept. And they rent their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads towards heaven. And they sat with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights. And no one dared to speak a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. So this is the word of God telling us to be quiet. When people need our presence, that's often all they need. They don't need the easy answers or the cute questions. They need the silence of love being there with them. Secondly, and we know when the silence should end. Normally it's, a ma it's days or weeks. You don't, we don't jump in with easy questions or easy answers. But immediately, as soon as is possible, we urge people to be honest with God about their feelings towards what's happened and towards him. Because if God is God, he can handle our anger. He wants our praise, he wants our love. What's the other side of that equation? He can handle us when we have to look at him and say, God, I love you, but I hate what you've done in my life. That sometimes is the only prayer we can make. Job's dialogue with God was exactly that, back and forth, back and forth, until God finally revealed to him that his plan was for goodness and not for evil. And Job, only after the give and take of anger and response, Job was ready to hear God's final assurance of his love for him. So silence first, then helping them be, be honest about what they're feeling. And don't force it. Maybe they're not feeling anger right there at that point. It'll probably come. Third, the first real input that I have found, and of course I'm speaking only as a Catholic priest, is to point to Mary at the foot of the cross and say, here is a perfect, immaculate human heart looking upon the death of her perfect divine son. What did she go through? Number one. Number two, she can help us process what we're going through. She can actually help us understand what God has allowed to happen in our life. Communing with the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the grief that we feel. Then, and only then, because this is the easiest one to bring up, 
Jesus on the cross and not right away saying God sacrificed his only son and you should be willing to sacrifice what you have. No, you point to Jesus in the depth of his grief saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, that's from his human, that's from his perfect humanity. He, he didn't find it easy to accept what was going, he was going through. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Contemplate what his experience was that is going to mirror ours because we are human as he is human. And then we point to the fact that the church has never, ever, ever proposed Good Friday without Easter Sunday. That there is a resolution to this terrible grief of Good Friday and to our terrible grief as well. And that is the joy of the victory of Easter Sunday. This is as far into theology as we want to get right now, all right? <clears throat> we don't want to talk about vicarious suffering, offering our soul, our suffering for the souls in purgatory, because people are not ready for that. And the great lesson of grief is never to take people where they are not. Never, and, and Maureen touched upon this, people begin to say, you should be through this by now. Ridiculous. First of all, the first thing I tell people is, don't expect anything of yourself for six months. Don't expect anything. And my experience was, imagine, so my father died in 92, my mother died in 94, my brother died in 97. Immediately after, one month after that, I was on a plane going to Rome to work. And I can remember getting off that plane and saying to myself, I don't even feel like a, a whole person anymore. I feel like some part of me has died and it's not coming back. Not just pain, I don't even really feel like a whole person. I don't feel like the person I was. All right, and this very, very wise and, uh, beginning of this is very true. Don't think about getting over grief. Think about getting through it. Don't think about it getting better. It might be better, but it will be different. It will be different when you finally get to deal with it. And every day, grief puts on a new face, but so does mercy. All right, so. This should, be, this should be our marching orders right here. And then, loss and the consolation of memory. We urge people to remember, to remember in the most benign, uh, in the most, the most peaceful way possible, the people that we have lost. They'll tell you right off if they're not ready to do that yet, because it will be too painful. But that is the next step. Then, a very, very difficult point at times, because people aren't ready to think of those who have gone before them needing prayers, I urge people to pray for the deceased. Pray for them. They need, they are still in communion with us. They, they, they hunger for our prayers. They hunger for our love. Those who die suddenly need our prayers no matter how sure we are of their goodness and where they are. That is an absolute unavoidable step of healing to pray for them and pray with them as well, of course. This is healing for people grieving, and it's also spiritual help for the deceased. We need each other from either side of the grave. And then finally, um, if you will, the most active part of helping people get through grief is you exhort them to live a good life. 
look at your life and see, look at your own life and see what you would want to change before you stand before God. Healing really takes off at this point when we look at ourselves and we say, for the sake of my, of my beloved dead, I want to be a better person. Huge, hugely important, if you will, the final spiritual step of grief management. Not everyone takes these steps differently. It's not, a, 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 don't, don't write down step one, two, three, four, five. We'll all, we all approach them in different ways. This is the way I have, I've dealt with my own grief and I've helped other people deal with theirs. Now, first of all, any questions about anything I've said? As I say, I'm giving you my, the effect or the product of my life as a Catholic priest and as a chaplain for many, many years. If any, any way I can help uh, with any questions on, on anything I've said. Good. Can I explain the role of purgatory? I've never, I didn't think I would hear this here, all right? <laughs> the role of purgatory. When we die, when every single one of us dies, we stand before the living God, all right? And we need perfection and purification, every single person, all right? What is the purification of purgatory? It is the purgation and the purification of divine love in our life. It is not punishment. It is the fire of divine love purifying our hearts and our lives so that we can stand before the living God. Because well, what does is, what is Moses, Moses and all the people of the Old Testament say? If you stand before the living God before you're ready, it's painful. So he is sure. He makes it possible that we be purified. And that is a process of love. All right? That's what, that's, what, that's what we understand by purgatory. The purification of divine love so that we will be able to truly look upon his face with joy. All right? And eternal, eternal bliss. Okay, now just to wrap up, if you will, I want to get back to this question of the tsunami and how does God, how can God allow this to happen, right? This is the great question. It's called theodicy. How can God be just? How can God be just when a child dies? How can God be just when a child suffers? So, the question of the, of the uh, righteousness of God, the justice of God, usually revolves around two things. Physical evil, physical evil, things like the mudslide in Washington State, the tsunami, volcanoes, earthquakes, whatever you want to say, physical evils that take innocent human life. How can God allow that to happen? And secondly, the death of the innocent, all right? No one, no one has the answers. There's no calculation, all right? There's no formula to allow us to understand. But I will say this, there's a wonderful Orthodox theologian whose name is David Bentley Hart. And he's a brilliant, brilliant man, also writes some of the most beautiful prose that's being written in, in this year of our Lord. And immediately after the tsunami, December 26th, 2004, people asked these questions. How can this happen? So he wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal and it was called In the Aftermath. And it was his personal reaction to these very serious and important questions. And he came up with a number of cautions one of the classic answers of Christian believers is to say, um, God is painting a beautiful picture of creation. And so for some of that beautiful picture, he needs shadows. And the shadows are these things that happen in life. 
That is a terrible, terrible, terrible way to look at physical evil and the suffering of the innocent. God doesn't need shadows. He doesn't make them happen in order to paint his beautiful picture of creation. So what is it? What happens? You have to be a believing Christian to really get this. But physical evil, uh, the disasters that we call, you know what? We call them acts of God, don't we? We call them an act of God. We don't, it was no one's fault, it just happened. And behind that we have in our minds, God, God did that, or God allowed it to happen. What he says is that in some way, physical creation, everything that we see in some way shares in the disorder caused by human sin. That somehow into the very fabric of creation, the imperfections of the human race have had this effect. All right, it's not science, it's not empirical science, all right, but it's right out of St. Paul. All creation groans in labor pains, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. And secondly, the other thing he says is he says that always make the distinction between the things that God causes in the world and the things that he allows to happen. In the mystery of his eternal being, we don't understand. And this is why one of the first questions you have to say to people, especially children, people who have lost their children, they say, why did this happen? And you say, we don't know yet. We don't know. And any priest, bishop, or pope who tells you we know and I have the answer is lying. All right? It's lying. We don't know. But we believe that at the revelation of God's final goodness, we will understand. We don't have it now. It's mystery and faith, but we will one day understand. And I just want to read to you, um, to finish up really, this beautiful, um, the end of his book. After he wrote this, uh, this David Bentley Hart, after he wrote this beautiful article in the Wall Street Journal, he expanded it. And I recommend it, it's called The Doors of the Sea. And he calls it that because he said, normally the sea has its doors, right? It doesn't go any further. The high tide comes up and it recedes, all right? But the doors of the sea were broken on December 26, 2004. And what happened? And here's what he said. When we learn in Christ the nature of our first estate, our first state of being, and we know the divine destiny to which we are called, that is eternal glory, we begin to see more clearly, the more we are able to look upon the world with the eye of charity, we begin to see that there is in all the things of earth a hidden glory waiting to be revealed, more radiant than a million suns, more beautiful than the most generous imagination or the most ardent desire can now conceive. Or rather, it is a glory not entirely hidden. It is veiled but shining in and through and upon all things. The imperishable goodness of all being given by God does in fact show itself in all that is. It shows itself in the vast waters of the Indian Ocean. And it is not hard to see when those waters are silver and azure under the midday sky, or gold and indigo in the light of the setting sun or jet and pearl in the light of the moon. And when their smoothly surging tides break upon the shore and harmlessly recede. But the beauty of God is still there even when the doors of the sea have been broken their seals. Those waters become suddenly dull and opaque with gray or sallow silt and rise up to destroy and kill without will or thought or purpose 
or mercy. At such times, to see the goodness in dwelling all creation requires a labor of vision that only the faith in Easter morning can sustain. But it is there, unfading, innocent, but languishing in bondage to corruption, groaning in anticipation of a glory yet to be revealed, both a promise of the kingdom yet to come and a portent of its beauty. Until that final glory, however, the world remains divided between two kingdoms where light and darkness, life and death grow up together and await the harvest at the end of time. In such a world, our portion is charity and our sustenance is faith, and so will it be until the end of days. As for comfort in this sad world, when I seek it, I can imagine none greater than the happy knowledge that when I see the death of a child, I do not see the face of God, but the face of his enemy. Such faith might never seem credible to someone who does not believe, but neither is it a faith that arguments can defeat. For it is a faith that set us free from optimism long ago and taught us how to hope instead. Now we are able to rejoice that we are saved not through the imminent mechanisms of history and nature, but by God's grace. That God will not unite all of history's many strands in one great synthesis, but he will judge much of history false and damnable. That he will not simply reveal the sublime logic of fallen nature, but he will strike off the fetters in which creation languishes. And that rather showing us how the tears of a child suffering were necessary for the building of the kingdom, he will instead raise up that child and wipe away all the tears from his eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor any more pain, for the former things will have passed away. And he that sits upon the throne will say, Behold, I make all things new. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Johnson. At this time, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Rosemary Sariva. My husband and I had several interactions with Rosemary through our bereavement support group. She has helped us through many tough times. And once again, I am proud to say she is a close friend and has listened to and wiped many of our tears off our face. Rosemary Sariva. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rosemary Sariva, and I am an employee of the Diocese of Fall River. I am the um, bereavement ministry, the events coordinator, and marriage ministry. How bereavement and marriage, I don't know why I got both of those, I don't know. I think it's something to do with loss, or sometimes getting married can be grieving. I don't know. Anyway, you know, what is grief? We always hear people talk about grief. and. One of the things we hear often is that grief and mourning are two of a kind. They are not. They are very distinct and different. Um, mourning is the outward expression of our grief. Mourning is when we go to the funeral home and we see people crying and, and expressing their feelings. That's the outward. Grief is our internal thought process. It's dealing with the emotions and feelings that are strongly coming at us, the confusion, um, the, the not knowing what to do next. Grief is healthy, um, and when people try to suppress that, they do more damage than good. In my experience with dealing with people in support groups, it's always amazing that I have people who come who have recently lost someone, and then I have people who come who 
have been dealing with loss for many years. Um, I've had experiences with someone who, after a death of a friend, realized he never grieved the death of his father 33 years before. And he was trying to rationalize why he was feeling these feelings 33 years later. But he had swept it under the rug. And I don't know if any of you have ever tried sweeping stuff under the rug. You eventually trip over it. I don't care how many times you try to sweep over it, sweep it, you will trip over it. But grief is very natural. It's something we need to do. It's our body's way of coping with this confusing time. You know, and we grieve because we love someone very deeply, and that's why it hurts. None of us wants to say goodbye to someone we love. Think of those people who have traveled. You've had relatives visit you from another country. Taking them to the airport is difficult. Can you imagine saying goodbye to someone knowing that there's no possible way you're going to see them again? Or at least not immediately. You know, I truly believe that I will someday be with those that I love. Now, what brought me here? Interesting, before this I was in sales, um, total opposite of what I do, and before sales I was in EMT. Uh, life sometimes takes us on the strangest paths and we don't know, but seven and a half years ago, um, my daughter, Rachel, died in a car accident. And I was immobile for a year. And that's what made me realize that there was no rushing grief. We can't rush it. We can't get up this morning and say, yep, this is it. Today I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to go on. Well, those days lasted for about two seconds. And that's one of the hardest things with us because people around us, we live in a society that wants to feel comfortable. So let's not talk about death and dying. Matter of fact, amongst yourself, think about, think about ways that people say someone died. How, when's the last time you heard someone say to you, my father died, my daughter died? Usually they'll give you something like they passed. Little kids love it. I heard a story the other day that really kind of brought it home, you know, and how we have to be careful sometimes and how we phrase things. Two little boys were found walking on the side of a very busy highway, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And people noticed it, so they called the police, and the police arrived, and they asked these two little boys what they were doing on the side of the highway. And they said to the policeman, we lost our grandfather, so we're going out to find him. So they're like, where's your parents? Well, they're at the funeral home. And he said, you know, my, they're crying and they're very sad, so we're going to find my grandfather, because I know he likes to go fishing, and he always goes over this bridge to go fishing. So, you know, you hear people say, you know, we, we try to shelter people, we try to even shelter each other from grief and loss and death. But yet, what we say sometimes is harmful to ourselves. We think we're protecting others and we're not. We're, we're buffering, like, like Father Johnson said, you know, sometimes we can't deal with it, so we try to come up with platitudes and we try to come up with ways to sugarcoat it. Um, I work with children, I do Rainbows, which is a program for children uh, from the ages of three up to young adults who are grieving from loss. And the losses in Rainbows aren't just death, they're, death, they're losses from divorce, they're losses from you know, parents being homeless, um, br uh, brothers or siblings moving, going to war and not coming back. So we're dealing with various kinds of losses. But one thing I've learned and what, that I take back to my adult support group is that children are very candid. They're very direct. They don't want sugar-coated anything. When they ask you, where is grandpa? You say he died. They're like, okay. That's really how they, and it's funny because until I started working with children, I didn't realize that they really don't want deep explanations. The same goes for us. When we're grieving, we're not looking for deep explanations. We're not looking, you know, like Father Johnson said before, we're not looking for that theological explanation. I don't know about you, but when I sat in the hospital room and they told me my daughter was dead, the last thing I wanted was somebody telling me, you know, she's in a better place. Screw that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Did I say that real loud? They're, the better place is in our arms. And anyone that has lost someone knows that. We want them here with us. We don't want them someplace else. But we come, in time with grief, we come to realize that, okay, they transitioned into this new life. And that's hard for us. It takes time, and we deal with it. You know, you hear people talk about stages and phases of grief, and, you know, a lot of times people will talk about, you know, 
Kubla Ross and the stages, those stages are for death and dying. They have nothing to do with grief. Grief is a seesaw ride. One day you're up, the next day you're down. One of the things I tell my support group, and I'll tell anyone that, that asks me, is grief is literally like landing in a foreign country. You've just arrived, you've got no ID, you've got no baggage, and you don't speak the language, but yet you're told to find your way around. That is grief. That is grief. You basically are told, here you go. Because we all experience it differently. The beauty of talking to someone and going for counseling or support groups or even finding someone else in your family or your immediate friends who have experienced a loss is that they at least know what you're going through. I could not honestly stand here and say, I know what all of you are going through. I have no clue what any of you are going through. I know what loss is. I know what emptiness feels like, and I know what it's like to long to see a loved one again. But I have no clue what you're going through, because our grief is as unique as we are. No two of us are the same. One of the analogies that we use with grief is snowflakes. No two snowflakes is the same. No two relationships are the same. Many of you have lost spouses, yet if you sit and talk, your relationship with your spouses are not the same. Some of them were, were extremely happy and you had no complaints, and some of us struggled. I mean, I've been married for 33 years and I love my husband dearly, but there are days where I would like to send him back into that foreign country. You know, but that's life. That's life. Same thing with our children. You know, they give us grief, but then we wouldn't do anything, we wouldn't have it any other way. But what we need to remember is that we are individuals, and that when we experience a loss, that loss is as individual to us as we are. The other thing with, you know, a lot of times I'll hear comparison. People will tell me, well, you know, your loss is greater than my loss, and there's no such thing. The only loss that's the most difficult is the loss you're going through. That is the most difficult grief to deal with, your own personal loss. There's no comparison. You're the only one that knows how much you're hurting. You're the only one that knows what you're going through. You're the only one that knows what that relationship meant to you. Many of you have brothers and sisters and you've lost a parent. If you sat down with your siblings and asked them how they felt or how they're feeling, you'd be surprised at how varied those emotions and those thoughts are. Because your, your relationship with your parent, your relationship with, with each other are totally different. You know, and your birth order, believe it or not, also plays a part in that. But there's different things. But one of the things that we need to remember is when we're grieving, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to be patient. People will give us advice, and I'm sure some of you have already heard some interesting advice. Plus, people will say things that you sit there going, did they even think before they open their mouth? But one of the things that we need is we need to express ourselves. We need to share our story. We need to share our loved one's story. One of the things that I always request in the support group is that they share the name of their loved one. Because one of the things that happens to us is many a times people around us, thinking they're protecting us, don't say the name of our loved one. And we so long to hear that name. That name was someone special. I rejoice when somebody says my dad's name or my daughter's name or any of my loved one's names because it's like somebody else remembers. And that's key to us. So we need to speak. We need to share that. We also need to accept help. The hottest word for me, a four-letter word, was help. It took me three to four months before I realized my grief was harder than anything I could handle. It was bigger than I was. And I finally reached my, talked to my physician. I said, I need help. But that was the hardest thing to do. And I encourage you. None of you need to do any of this alone, ever. Grief is very difficult. Grief is messy, it's dirty, it's confusing. It is hard work. But you don't have to do that alone. There are many people out there that have been where you are now. There are, are where you are right now. And even if they're just a year ahead of you, if you will, that not that there's time frames, but they've been there, done that. They understand and they know that what you're doing and what you're reacting and how you're, you're behaving isn't crazy. You are not crazy when it comes to grief. Everything in grief is normal. Everything. Um, my daughter has a pair of flip-flops. 
that are in my closet. Now, it's going to be eight years in September since she died, and my husband was taking the flip-flops out of my closet. And I said to him, what are you doing with those flip-flops? He goes, well, you never wear them. I said, they're not mine. He goes, what are you, why are they in the closet? I said, those are Rachel's. I don't think that man could have put those flip-flops back fast enough. I have never worn them. But seven and a half years later, almost eight years later, they have a prominent place in my closet. And they will always have a prominent place in my closet. But if I told that to someone else, they'd think, OK, she's having a problem. She's not moving on. She's not getting over it. The only thing you go over in life are bridges and obstacles. Everything else you go through. And grief is one of those things you go through. And you have to give yourself permission to feel, to grieve. And you have to give yourself permission to hold on to things that mean something to you. Many times you'll hear someone say, oh, a linking object or something, something that just brings you comfort. Those flip-flops in my closet, every once, this morning I looked at them when I was trying to figure out what pair of shoes to wear. And I moved them gently to the side and got my shoes. Many a time spouses will wear their, their husband or wife's wedding band around their wing, their, uh, their neck, I'm sorry. And once in a while you'll see someone, if they, somebody mentions the name of their loved one, you'll see them play with the ring. You'll see them reach over for that ring. Or they'll reach over for a favorite breast, bra bracelet that belonged to a daughter or a, or a child or a grandmother. And the reason they do that is because the name got mentioned and this is the linking object. By touching that ring, by touching that favorite piece of jewelry, by touching that, you're thinking of them and you're feeling them with you. And that's important. There's no... You know, you'll hear people say, oh, oh my God, they've created a shrine. Now, I don't know about any of you, but do you have pictures of your loved ones in your house, the ones that are living? You have pictures in your house. So if I went to any one of your homes right now, you probably have a bigger gallery than the Museum of Fine Art. I don't know about you, but I have grandchildren, so now my house looks like I, I could really start selling tickets and having people coming in and checking my photos. Why is it any different when someone dies? Why does all of a sudden it become a shrine because you have the pictures up of your loved one? Why is that any different? They're still part of your life. They've simply stepped into the next room, like that famous poem says. They've stepped into the next room. But they're still part of who you are. Nothing has changed. You know, you heard Maureen and you heard Father Johnson say, the love continues. The love never dies. And that's what makes it hard. You know, one of the analogies that always comes to mind is when people tell me, you know, everybody's telling me I should be over this, I should be over this. You know, have you had surgery? If any of you in this room have had surgery or have had an injury where you've got scar, that surgery, that injury hurts. It really hurts a lot. You get help with it. You know, you might get medication to ease the pain, but it hurts. And then eventually, it starts to become a dull throb or a dull ache. But you have a scar. And you never forget where you got that scar. That's our loved ones. Our, we never get over grief, ever. You don't forget someone you love dearly. That's impossible. So why are we being told that, oh, you shouldn't be grieving. You should be over this. Every one of us has scars. And every one of us remembers how we got those scars. Our loved ones are not scars in our lives, but they are someone that left a mark on us, an impression on us that we will never forget. We became who we are because of them, even if it was a child. Our life changed the minute that child was born. Our life changed again the minute that child died. Your life changed the day you said, I do. Your life changed the day you said goodbye. It changes, there's that constant wave of changing. And we become someone totally new. Grief changes us. What we do with those changes is entirely up to us. We can't control it. We can't, there's nothing we can do. And that's what makes it frustrating. Grief becomes frustrating because we lose control. And we live in a day and time where we need to be controlled. Most of us have our iPhones or iPads or something, and our whole schedule is in this little thing. And God forbid you lose your phone, or you lose your planner, or you lose any of that stuff. Because your whole life is dictated. And when, we, we, when someone we love dies, all that gets thrown out the window. 
all of a sudden there's chaos. And we're not used to chaos. We're used to having organized lives. All of a sudden there's dust on furniture that we used to clean meticulously every week. All of a sudden, dinner isn't on the table. All of a sudden, you don't care what you're wearing today. And you realize, you know something? There are things that are more important in life. And you, you heard it over and over again, that grief makes us take stock of our life. We look at our life and we look at it and we say, what really, really matters? We can't change anything we did, and we can't let guilt. You know, I hear that a lot. I should have done more. I could have been there. I should have known. I should have seen this coming. There's nothing any of us could do. Nothing any of us could do. My daughter died in a car accident. My daughter died 40 miles away from where, I was, where my husband and I were. I know more could have gotten there and prevented her from getting into that car accident than I than anything. You know, we, we can't prevent what happens. What we deal with is we realize that we have our loved ones, we have those memories, we have all that to hold on to. And how they died, one of the things that is really critical is we don't let go of them. You know, you hear somebody say, you gotta let go, you gotta let go. We don't let go of it. What we let go of and what helps us heal is when we let go of how they died. When we start to let go of how they died and grasp onto how they lived, we start to heal. Because now we look for the joys. We look for what they meant to us. The death does not define. I mean, I've dealt with people who have de died, family members who have dealt with people who have died from illness, from car accidents, from overdoses, where unfortunately now we're in a time where it seems to be prevalent. And I was talking to a friend from Taunton who Within, within two weeks, they had 15 deaths in Taunton alone from the, the epidemic at this point of heroin. And when families come and ask for help, it's, that didn't define who your loved one was. The drug was an addiction, just like alcohol, just like anything else. The life defines them. That's who you remember, and that's how you start to heal. When you start to remember what they meant in your life, yes, it hurts. Yes, we don't forget. Yes, we miss them dearly, but we realize that they made a difference in our life, and we wouldn't change that for anything. And they gave us the ability to get up. They gave us the strength to get up and face a new day. They gave us the ability. I look at what I'm doing today, and if you had told me eight years ago I'd be standing up here talking to anyone about grief and death and dying, I tell you, you were nuts. But yet my daughter, put me in that exact spot. And she's, I'm here because she felt that I needed to help others. And you heard Maureen say it, and you heard Father Johnson say it. We have to look beyond what we have, and we have to say, you know something, what did I learn from this? Because grief is a learning process. Um, and that's one thing I encourage, learn everything you can about grief. Understand what you're going through. And that helps you realize that there isn't anything abnormal with you or happening to you. But educate yourself and then say, you know something, what did I learn and how can I help someone else? That's exactly what I went through when a few years ago I came to BCC and I received my certificate of fanathology and shortly thereafter um, started a support group because one of the things I found was that there wasn't many support groups. And I run mine weekly because I went to various ones and the monthly ones just weren't enough for me. I needed to know that I had a place to go to every week because there are some weeks that you're fine and then there's some weeks that, you know, a memory. One of my favorite things that I remember was going, I actually stopped going shopping, okay, because stop and shop aisle, cookie aisle was treacherous. I remember one day going down and getting cookies and all of a sudden I um, looked at a package of cookies and started bawling my eyes out because it was my favorite, my daughter's favorite cookies. So I stopped going shopping, I used Peapod. <laughs> but you find ways, you find ways to get around. And you've heard methods, there are methods of helping you. Um, journaling was one of the tools that I used. I was able to get my thoughts out of my head and on those sleepless nights, sometimes just writing what I was thinking. Even though I looked back at a couple of pages, I haven't been able to read my journals, it was enough to get that out of my mind and onto paper and let me get a couple of hours of sleep. If journaling, if you're not a writer, maybe just taking a walk, you know, 
Many a times I took a walk with my big, big sunglasses and let the tears flow down my face. And that was good. One of the places, this is gonna sound odd, but if you want a quiet place where nobody disturbs you, go sit in a cemetery. Nobody will bother you. It sounds strange, but when I couldn't find peace at home and I needed solitude, I either, I either went to the cemetery and sat in my daughter's grave or I went by and sit by the water. One of the things too I recommend is if you are having a hard time with grief, is find a place in your own home where you can say to family members and say to others, when I step into XYZ room, I need to be alone. And that allows your family and others in your life to realize that once in a while, you've got to step out of life. You've got to step out and just need a quiet moment. My sanctuary was my bedroom. And if the door was open, my kids and my husband knew they could come in. If I closed the door, they knew I needed a few moments alone. Some people will go to a park bench. They'll go sit by, this is a beautiful place to sit. They'll go sit by some water. Some have told me they go to the library because in the library they be quiet. They can be quiet and nobody will bother them. One of the other things too that's really nice, go sit in a movie. You, just sit in the theater because one, nobody can see you. Two, you can cry your eyes out and nobody will know. And you know, where's Darlene? Darlene told me. <laughs> <laughs> Darlene one day came to the support group at night and told me she spent seven hours at the theater just popping from movies to movies because she didn't want to think. She just went, she went from theater to theater. I needed to be in the dark. I woke up, saw the light, and said, oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Father. <laughs> but you didn't hear that. <laughs> but sometimes you find, mm -hmm. you've got to find things like that that, you know, can help you just to, to just get out of that. Or, Allow yourself to be in it. And one of the things, and I'm going to wrap up. No, one you don't have to. Oh, I don't? No, okay. No, no. I thought you were telling me a no, lot of time. No. One of the things that we hear a lot of times, it's funny, is don't cry. How many times have you been told not to cry? If I had a dime for every time someone told me not to cry, I'd probably be a multimillionaire right now. It got to the point where I actually one day got so upset and I said, you know something? I earned the right to cry. And I'm gonna cry whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, there's the door. You know, they never left, but they never stopped me from crying again. We need to cry. Some people don't. And I don't want you to think, oh my God, something's wrong with me. But grief tears are not like regular tears. Grief tear tears have a healing property to them. They're actually a different chemical composition, and that anyone of you in physics can look it up. But it's the tears that we cry when we grieve cleanse. They cleanse the soul. They cleanse us. I can tell you after many, many times where I've had a good cry, and uh, let me tell you, there were times where those tears would not stop no matter what I tried to do. I could stand on my head and the tears would not stop. They were going to come whether I liked them or not. But after I allowed myself to just cry, to be in that moment, I felt a relief. I felt an unburdening. I felt like, okay, okay, this is gonna be okay. Didn't mean that two days later I didn't start again. But tears are important. Expressing our emotions and feelings are important. We need to express them. We can't bottle them up. Otherwise, you'll be coming to counselors and psychologists years later trying to figure out why you're all of a sudden dealing with these pent up emotions. We need to deal with it. And if you have people around you who are trying to prevent you from experiencing your grief, find somebody that will let you experience your grief. Um, Father Johnson said something that really struck me. You know, that when you first come across someone who's lost someone, that you don't say anything. I remember the greatest help I got was from a friend. I called and said I was having a rough day. And she came over. And we sat for three hours sat for three hours and sat, said absolutely nothing to each other. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. And then she left. And I called her the next day and I said, thank you. And she goes, I didn't do anything. I said, you did more than you realize. She sat with me for three hours and we did not talk. And then she left. And I felt so good. She didn't give me platitudes. She didn't try to reason things off. She let me just be where I needed to be. If I cried, she cried with me. If I laughed, she laughed with me. But she just let me be where I needed to be. 
And that's what you need to do for yourself. You need to be patient with yourself. You need to find someone that will allow you to be you. You're hurting. It hurts. And you need to allow yourself to feel that hurt. You know, you'll hear someone say, oh, you know, that's all self-pity. You're not self-pitying. You're hurting. You've, you've just, your life just turned upside down. You're missing someone who meant the world to you. Of course. Well, if it's self-pity, it's self-pity. But you're hurting. And you want people to know that this person meant the world to you. You're not self-pitying. You're not showing signs of weakness by crying. You're not confused or crazy or anything like that. You're just in that foreign country. You're just in that foreign place trying to find your way around. Feeling, groping, grabbing onto lifelines, grabbing onto whatever you can to make it through. One thing I can say is you will make it through. As messy as it gets, as confusing as it gets, as discouraging as it gets, you will make it through. I'm standing here today proof that we make it through. Darlene is proof that we make it through. Every one of you has a story, and you've made it through. You've made it through small losses and large losses. You make it. We all make it. Grief changes us, and hopefully it changes us in positive ways. I'm going to share something um, real quick, and then I will wrap it up, unless someone has questions. But I'm always looking for poems and things, and this is interesting little poem. It's by Nancy Allen Kelly, and it's Shadows of My Mind. In shadows of our memories, lying quietly aside, are moments of togetherness, wherein bonded love abides. So often as I think of you and the softness of your smile, I see the twinkle in your eyes, flickering with jest and guile. Now as lights of solitude hover in and out of mind, you are there forever, just as limitless as time. And there will I always find you in the shadows of my mind. Any questions or anything? I, hopefully I answer some questions. And anything, anything you want to know about grief or some of the things you've heard that has been confusing? No? Well, I thank you for your time. And I do work for the diocese, and I do run a support group. If I can be of any help to anyone, I'm always available. There are, my cards are on the table. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, ooh. So I know, I know. It's like, I know. Um, as opposed to like, my mind would be, you know, I shop, I shop a lot. That's my, that turns into my addiction. That's where I go to, I surround myself with inanimate objects and um, with the tags on them still. Isn't it different for everybody? Some people would do, maybe do drugs or, or someone might turn to alcohol after or right. someone, it's, it's totally different for everybody. We do, we, we all are very unique. We all handle stress, we all handle uh, loss, we all handle changes in our lives differently. Um, you know, our transitions, you, you move away from home. And that's difficult, because now you have to adapt to a new life, and mommy, mom and dad aren't there to pick up the pieces. And yes, we all grieve very, very differently. And sometimes we find solace in, our, in addictions. Hopefully, that isn't the case. But there is people that help. I mean, shopping is definitely an addiction. It's just like alcohol. It's just like anything. But we do. We do look for ways to comfort ourselves. And that's exactly what it is. You know, these are, these are ways that we find. So if I'm going to spend a couple of hours in the store, I don't have to think about anything. You know, if I just have one more drink, I'll get numb, and I'm not going to feel the pain anymore. If I take this drug, it'll all go away. If I just don't talk about it, I don't have to deal with it. And we do. We find, we find ways to push it aside. What I'm trying to say is that we can't. Eventually, eventually, it comes back to us. Does it always come back? It does come back. And you're surrounded by mess. Yes. And now it's more confusing because the people around us are trying to figure out why 30 years later, why is all of a sudden they're missing their dad? Why all of a sudden are they crying uncontrollably? Because they didn't deal with it 30 years ago. You know, they, they tried to hide it. I, I've talked to people who just pushed it aside and didn't want to face it. And now all of a sudden I'm trying to figure out why these raw emotions are happening. I should have gotten over that 30 years ago. 
Thank you very much. You're welcome. welcome. I hope that adds to that. Any other questions? Thank you. And please give Judith your undivided attention. Thank you, everyone. You are a whoops. You are a wonderful audience. You've been very quietly and patiently listening to everyone. And I just saw someone I haven't seen in a couple of years. Hi. <laughs> um, well, first of all, um, when I looked at the uh, brochure that Maureen had put together, she gave me 15 minutes uh, to speak. And that's what I prepared for. And now she tells me I have half an hour. So um, I'm, we'll work it out anyway. <laughs> Thank you. You've been very uh, attentive and great audience. Um, I, too, I am a bereavement counselor. And I will just give you a brief uh, history about myself. And um, I think what I'll do, having listened to Father Johnson and to Rosemary, you learned a lot about grief from the uh, spiritual perspective. And you've learned a lot of the facts about grief, an excellent presentation. And so I think I'll take my few minutes to define for you, well, what is a grief counselor? What do they do? What is a support group? What can I expect? Who goes to support groups? And all those questions that you might have as you ponder, should I? connect with a counselor or seek out a, a, a grief support group. So briefly, I will tell you that um, when I was a young girl at seven, my mother passed away. I was her only child, and it was a very, very hard time for me. I missed her terribly. And I'm sure the adults within my family were very well-meaning but nobody talked to me about my mother's passing. I remember hearing my aunt, I, my aunt was living at the house at the time my mother was in the hospital, and I remember waking up in the night and my aunt's crying on the phone telling some relatives that my mother had passed. And I didn't know how to absorb this because I had been told she was going to be coming home. And I just put the covers over my head and finally fell asleep. The next morning, my dad came in and he said, Mom is gone. I didn't know how to handle it. I just put the covers over my head again, and I turned away. And nothing was said. I don't even know when her funeral was. I don't know who went, who didn't. It wasn't me. And that really lingered with me for a very long time. When I was 17, my father dropped dead of a heart attack. Um, I was completely lost. I became a ward of the state of Massachusetts. Um, Well-meaning pe people stepped into my life, made some decisions that I agreed to because I didn't know what my options were. It, it all worked out OK. But I was a lost soul for many, many decades, literally. Um, it was a long journey. And I struggled for many years because I had no one to talk to. I didn't go to anybody. I didn't mention anything about that grief. And as Rosemary said, you hold that in, and someday it's just going to explode out. Well, it did. <laughs> and, um, but it was a slow process. And um, I spent many years fumbling through life. I had four children, ended up divorced, and all on my, my own as the kids grew up and went away. And not sure what to do with myself. And everybody kept saying to me, you ought to become a counselor. You should become a counselor. And I go, why do we think I should become a counselor? Because they said, you have that personality, but you also have that life experience. And so um, I decided after uh, becoming um, a grandmother that um, I would go back to school. So I entered um, the um, master's program at South A. Virginia University in their holistic um, counseling program. 
and attended school, much to my surprise, I'd be sitting in the classroom going, I can't believe I'm sitting here with all these other people. But my experience there was challenging, but it was very healing for me, very healing for me. And um, um, I'll just share briefly that um, uh, Salve Regina is a Catholic university and I'm not a Catholic. But one day <laughs> we were sitting in class and um, we had a meditation and a prayer time. And I was sitting there and all of a sudden during this meditation, I sincerely received a visit from the Blessed Mother. And I was sitting there crying, the tears coming down, and a part of me saying, this can't be possible. I'm a Protestant. I'm not a Catholic. Why would the Blessed Mother come to me? But I also felt that that was a confirmation for me personally, that I was on the right road, that I was doing what I was called to do, and it just kind of cemented the experience for me. Well, I enjoyed my uh, years there so much that I uh, continued on for another year in the um, Expressive Arts program. And that's not art class. Expressive Arts is finding ways to express yourself when you don't have the words to share with other people. Um, Rosemary said she was working with children, and I too work with children, um, because they don't have the cognitive skills or the vocabularies to express their thoughts and feelings. Um, I have multitudes of tools and ways that I work with the kids that they can get those feelings out. So it was well worth it to me to stay that extra year. So I am a certified expressive arts therapist. Well, that wasn't enough for me. <laughs> I got on this roll and I just kept going. So then from Newport, I went up to Providence where I went to chaplaincy school because my spiritual life was very important to me as well. And I do truly believe and feel that um, our spiritual lives are every bit as important as our mental and our physical bodies. And I wanted to clearly incorporate that into my practice. So with that, I um, found myself uh, in hospice and did my um, well, I gotta back up a minute. I did my clinical hours at Rhode Island Hospital, which was an amazing year. Um, I saw a lot of things, some things I wish I hadn't seen, some things I'm very grateful for the experience that I had, and I pray for those patients up there almost daily. From there, I, I got involved with the hospice organization, and I have been with them off and on ever since then. Um, I am currently, a uh, bereavement counselor and a chaplain for hospice, but recently I've cut back my hours there because I want to uh, be in private practice and work more with children. As my part of, part of my counseling with hospice, I developed a children's programs and I have been going in and out of um, uh, schools throughout the Massachusetts area with a six-week bereavement program for kids bringing my expressive art, uh, tools with me for them. So, with that, I'll move on to what is a grief counselor. I'm sure many of you have some idea of what that is. Um, I just want to start with one little story that this is the starting point where I meet people when I meet them as a counselor. Once there was a little child who went on an errand for her mother. She was late returning and her mother asked her for an explanation. The child replied that a playmate of hers had fallen and broken her doll and that she had helped. The mother wondered what the child could do to help mend a broken doll. And then she heard this marvelous reply. I just sat down and helped her cry. There are times when we are with other people and we cannot solve their problems. We can only become a part of their grief, blending our tears with theirs. And that is the beginning of my process in support groups and as a counselor. My role is very passive in many, many ways. I have to listen. That's a lot of what I do, is I listen. And I encourage 
and I never judge, and I never say should. <laughs> um, when you come to a bereavement counselor, it's a place where that counselor is going to help you feel safe and secure so that you can feel comfortable sharing those uncomfortable thoughts and feelings that you perhaps are unable to share with even members of your family um, or friends. There's the place where you can vent and you can say, I can't believe what they said to me. It's a place where I just allow that space for people to be who they are and what they need to say. I also notice that in providing that place for them and as they open up, um, we talk about many, many things and um, I notice that a lot of people struggle in, this is in groups and one-on-one -on -one counseling. People are often grieving about the fact that they've lost somebody that they've loved, but one of their biggest challenges that they do not expect is learning how to live without that person. They are not expecting that the vast openness would be in front of them at this point in their lives. It's particular with spouses, and especially if you have cared for that loved one for months or even years, people are at a loss as to how to go on from there. So a lot of what I do is help to encourage people with many different ways in that listening, in supporting them, in suggestions, exploring ideas, help them find that new life that needs to be formed. And from there, I hope to help people reach the place where they can say, I'm glad I had that experience with that person, and begin to celebrate that precious relationship that you had with them, and to move on into a new life that you can find rewarding and even happy and um, fulfilling when a lot of people at first are afraid that their lives are over, they're not. And there's a wonderful, wonderful days ahead for each and every person that has lost someone. Do I miss my loved ones? Absolutely. But I also think that the experience of losing my parents kind of taught me to understand. And it gave me the, the lessons in my life to learn that I can be open and understanding of you all and those that grieve. And so with that, um, unless you have any questions, then I'd be happy to answer either now or down um, off the floor. I'd be happy to do that. And thank you for your time and for listening to me. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I just have um, a little bit more to say, and then I'm going to introduce um, the representatives from STAR, so if you could just hang on a little longer so that they can come up and say a few words themselves. Um, I want to thank to all our speakers. Again, we can see loss wears many faces, whether the loss of a loved one, a pet, a divorce, or even a job. Grief is normal after loss. Although there are similarities in the loss process, everyone has a personal and unique journey to inner healing. Grieving awfully often involves dealing with challenging and difficult emotions. It is important to recognize that these feelings are a natural response to loss. Sometimes these feelings are a natural response to grief. Sometimes these feelings can be painful overwhelming, persist for some times, even years after your loss. You may still, feel, still have these feelings and some unanswered questions. This is why we are here today, to open up a dialogue and show what resources are available, whether it's simply to talk about your loss or to even go further to a healthcare plan to aid in your healing. There is always a place to turn. And in conclusion, I'd like to read a short poem by an unknown author that has personally touched me and helped me understand my grief as well. 
We will learn to live the new norm. The title of the poem is called, They Say There Is a Reason. They say there is a reason. They say that time will heal. But neither time nor reason will change the way I feel. For no one knows the heartache that lies behind our smiles. No one knows how many times we have broken down and cried. We want to tell you something so there won't be any doubt. You're so wonderful to think of, but so hard to live without. I want to thank you again, all the speakers and the volunteers who have helped make this event a success and who have come together. So I want everybody again to enjoy the wonderful food from all the local sponsors, Letty's Bakery, again, Papa Gino's, Dunkin' Donuts, um, and again, Stop and Shop donated these beautiful on Rodman Street, wonderful um, arrangements. So now I'd like to call up uh, Linda and Crystal from STAR. Thank you very much. Again, enjoy your day, and I'm so glad, and I hope that you are gonna leave with something more than what you came with. And I hope this event has helped someone or touched someone in, in a special way. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm not the kind of person that likes to hold a microphone. Me either. So, <laughs> my name is Crystal, and this is Linda Catino. Hi. And we come from STAR. We first want to thank Darlene for inviting us and hosting this event. We think it's really great that she's a uh, brat just arise the awareness in terms of grief um, and we want to just talk a little bit about the services that we have to provide. Can't hear, Can't hear me? That's even better. <laughs> So with the rising epidemic of the heroin overdoses that we've been experiencing in our community and other communities, we thought it was important that we just speak a little bit about the services that we provide at STAR. And, um, we now, in the 37 years we've been delivering innovative services, we recently opened an open access center, which means that patients are able to walk into our access center and access services that same day. So they're able to be triaged to the appropriate level of care. Um, they could access services in our inpatient detox or our outpatient um, counseling. They could access services at our Lifeline, which is our methadone service clinic. And um, we also provide a grief support group that meets weekly. So, and individual counseling as well for, um, for grief support. We have the brochures. We do have um, brochures and information over at our table. So if people want to come over and ask questions, we can certainly be available to answer any questions that you may have. Linda's going to talk a little bit about our family. So, um, I hate mics. I wonder if I hold it if I do that. I don't know. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, we started the Arise um, Family Intervention Model at STAR. I don't know if any of you have ever seen intervention on television. Um, anybody? Raise your hands. Um, that's the Johnson model of intervention. We don't do that. Um, our intervention model is um, ARISE. We invite the addicted individual to come to the ARISE meeting. And um, so there's no blame or shame or guilt with the family. A lot of times, like the Johnson model, the people will just get mad at the families and really ruin some, some connections that they have. So we do, um, we invite the addicted individual. We work a lot over the phone with the families before the intervention takes place. And we um, use a genogram, kind of like a family tree. And I have to talk louder than them. <laughs> um, so with this family tree, we go back three generations and look at the um, trauma and substance abuse in the families. And we work with that to see what is affecting the person, the addicted individual that we're going to do the intervention with. And um, we invite the person to come. But one interesting thing that we do too is if the addicted individual doesn't come to the meeting, we still hold the meeting because we're working with the family. Because we're trying to build a network of support um, to work together to help the addicted individual. And um, one thing that I love to tell my families is the biggest thing that I can teach them actually is to stop working with the addicted individual one-on-one. -on -one because the manipulation of the disease wins when you do that. So you need to unite as a family and build a network of support to do that. Um, we work with the family for up to six months 
because we're really trying to strengthen that bond with them. And um, the best thing about this is it's free. Um, STAR was awarded a, a grant through the BSAS, Bureau of Substance Abuse. So we're able to help families in Massachusetts to overcome the addiction, help them. I mean, addiction is um, a disease of relapse. So we do see many relapses, but we still work with the families so that they can work through that next relapse. Um, did I touch the thing there? No. So um, we also have a family support group that meets on Wednesday evenings from 6 to 7.30. It's a very small group right now, and the families that have started coming have been coming for like a, over a year already. They love it. They learn a lot from each other and really get that support from each other. Um, we've had some families that have come that have experienced overdose deaths, um, and we work with them, but they do belong like in some of our other grief groups that helps them a little bit more. But they, the support they get is just unbelievable. I mean, they're very happy to, to, to come to these groups. Um, it, and again, that's all I have to say. I'll, we'll take questions if there are any questions, but we have plenty of brochures for everybody to take if they're interested. So any questions? Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darlene.